the six things. And I, as Lorene said, I really appreciated this lesson because it kind of helped us get an overview of some of the things that are important when we're making these first time contacts. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm really counting on the leaders to spend good time on the lesson today, to look at all six of these things, some of the scriptural background that you used to help us understand what these six things are. And we're going to go a little deeper with just, just one of them today. But we're going to remember what were these six things. The first one is a sign that we see at the side of the road, which is stop. All right. The second one has to do with something that we do with our eyes. We look, all right. The third has something to do with an expression of pleasure, which is smile, okay. The fourth one has to do with extending a hand, which we refer to as a handshake, right? Extending a hand. The fifth one has to do with what we do with our ears, which is, and we're going to talk about that in two weeks. And the last one has to do with learning that person's name. And so we have these six things. We stop, we look, we smile, we extend a hand, we listen first and then converse, and then we learn to call the person by name. Cheryl said something in the study guide that I thought was very interesting and important. She said, the goal is to master the art of a first meeting and then to apply the principles ever more deeply to friendships we already have. And that's what we're going to be doing actually the next two weeks. Next week, we're going to take a little closer look at stop, look, and smile. And then two weeks from today, we're going to take a closer look at extending your hand, listening and conversing, and calling by name. Now, I'm not teaching next week, Cheryl is, so I'm going to leave the stop, look, and smile to her. That's her territory. I have two weeks from today, which is extend your hand, listen and converse, and call by name. And so today, we're going to look a little more deeply as what it means to reach out, what it means to extend a hand. But the question still remains, how can I make new friendships? Or how can I deepen the friendships that I already have? And I think the answer to that is really pretty obvious. And the obvious answer is I need to become a better friend. The second part of the title of our study guide, our our study guide title is Navigating Friendships, and the second part of that is Becoming the Friend You Want to Have. And this is really saying what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, do to others as you would have them do to you. But as we've said many, many times, the only person I can change is me. I can't change you. I can't make you a better friend to me. I can't make you a better friend to other people. I can't do anything as far as changing you. The only person I can change is myself. And so extending a hand is what is important. Now I thought it would be interesting to think a little bit and to learn a little bit about what a handshake really is, where it came from. And I discovered that the first one that I could find, the first illustration of a handshake, goes clear back to the 9th century BC. That's almost 3,000 years ago. And in this drawing, it isn't a drawing, excuse me, it's a carving that you see there. This is actually a handshake between an Assyrian and a Babylonian ruler forming an alliance. Now, historians are not exactly sure what the symbolism of the handshake is, but they think because the right hand was the hand of strength, it was this, the hand in which you always carried your armament, whether it was a sword or a spear or whatever. Your left hand was more defensive. You used your shield or whatever with your left hand. But your right hand was your hand of battle. And so when you came with an empty hand, as they both did, they both had empty right hands, that was an indication that they were coming in peace. There was no intention of war. There was no intention of uh, anything that was serious, bore no ill will against the other. It was an act of peace. And that's what historians think is probably the symbolism behind a, a handshake. Rather interesting. Well, about a thousand years later, when we come up to the time of the Romans, and this, of course, is when Jesus was on earth, the uh, handshake was common uh, among people as a symbol of friendship and loyalty. In fact, that's a symbol of clasped hands, and I didn't get a picture of this, but a, a symbol, the symbol of pairs of clasped hands even appeared on some Roman coins. 
And so it's very possible that during Jesus' day, the handshake was already something that was commonly in use. Well, today, of course, we use the symbol again. And the symbol we use today has a variety of different meanings as we shake hands. Sometimes we do it in greeting, greeting perhaps for the first time. We may do it in just greeting people, uh, parting from people. We sometimes use it as a, a sign of congratulations. We've all been at graduation ceremonies where I was at one this summer when my, gr my grandson graduated from high school. And all the kids march down, you know, and there's about four or five administrators from the school district and they all shake hands and say, congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. So it's, it's used as a symbol of congratulations. It also is used in business. Many times two business people will be making an agreement or whatever and they will shake hands and as they shake hands and part hands, then the deal is completed. So we use it for a variety of different reasons. We also use it in sports sometimes. You've seen where the teams line up, sometimes before the game, sometimes after the game, and they all pass by and say, good game, good game, good game, even though they feel terrible about it because they've just lost, and the others feel really good about it because they've won. But we have all these various uses of the handshake. But a handshake really is intended to be a symbol of reaching out. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Building more meaningful connections in friendships that we already have. Now, if we never get beyond the point of just sticking out our hands and saying, hello, how are you today? Or hello, nice to see you. How deep is that friendship going to go? Not very deep, is it? And so we want to go beyond that. We want to go to the next couple of lessons that we're, we're going to be looking at and how these same symbols that we use in our initial meetings with people need to be continued and deepened for that friendship to grow. That's what we're going to be looking at. So what does it look like to extend a hand or to reach out in friendship to another person? Well, we're going to look at three different ways. And this is not necessarily exhaustive. There could be a variety of different ways. But three ways that I want to suggest that we can reach out in deepening a friendship is through our words, through our actions, and following the example that Jesus gave us. First, we're going to look at what it means to reach out with our words. Now, I want to say before we get into this in the next couple, that as I was putting these together, and as I was drawing out some of these principles, I didn't think about it at the time, but one of the things that we did last week was look at some assessments of how we are different in personality and temperament. And one of the assessments that was given to us in our study guide by Cheryl was the five love languages by our, the author Gary Chapman. Gary Chapman is a clinical sci uh, sociologist and he, after many years of being with people and uh, counseling them, he began to see a pattern he began to see that there were five different ways that people really responded to love. And he actually named these five. And some of you are very familiar with this. Others may not be, so I want to just kind of look at these. The first one is words of affirmation. The second one is quality time. The third one is acts of service. The fourth one is gifts. And the fifth one is physical touch. Now, you may already know what your love language is. That's the thing that when it's done to you, you just feel so good. You feel so loved. You feel so, so just enveloped by the person's love and concern and compassion for you. Others may be good, but they just don't, they just don't ring your bell. My, one of my primary love languages, and we usually have a primary one and we may have a secondary one. My primary love, love language is probably acts of service. Now, if you do something for me, that is really wonderful. Some of the other things I could take or leave, but when you come and take part of my load and do something for me, that is really wonderful. Now, one of the things that Dr. Chapman talks about is that one of the difficulties in the love language scenario is we tend to use our love language and express that out to other people because that's what's natural for us and that's what feels good to us. And so we tend to use the language that we like to receive back to other people. Only problem is, is that many times it's not their love language. 
my son and daughter-in-law and three grandchildren live just about 30 minutes up the road. And as I said, I have the uh, love language of acts of service. And when I go up there, usually we're just there with the kids. Uh, my son and his wife are both working. And if I see something that needs to be done, I just do it. You know, if there's some dishes in the sink, I'll wash the dishes or fold some laundry or do whatever. I think nothing about it because that's how I receive love. I, and so therefore, that's how I express love. That isn't their love language. Now, I know my daughter-in-law appreciates the fact that I will fold a load of clothes, but it doesn't do for her what it does for me. So in all of this, we have to kind of remember it isn't just what means something to us that we need to be expressing to other people. We need to know what means something to them and use that language with them. Now, this is kind of a long introduction, but as I looked through the things, the words that we say, and the things that we do that are ways to reach out, I realized that I was really looking at the love languages in many ways. All right, the first thing when we get into what does it mean to reach out with our words, the first thing that we can do, we can reach out with actions of care and concern. When a person is going through a difficult time, when something is going on in their life that you know is painful for them, expressions of care and concern with our words are extremely important. And you can do this, of course, with notes, with texts. You can respond to a Facebook post that they may have put up that shows you uh, just kind of where their heart is. You may have a coffee chat with them, any number of ways. But we need to be alert to the, the needs in other people's lives and when they're hurting and respond with our words that we care, that we have compassion, that we have concern for them. All right, the second thing, words of affirmation and encouragement. Now, words of affirmation is one of the love languages, right? And we can show our affirmation in a lot of different ways. We can express gratefulness for their character, just the kind of person they are. We can express gratefulness for their attitudes, good attitudes that encourage us. We can also express uh, affirmation for their, for their actions. Now this, as I said, is one of the love languages. And although it may not be my love language, I've never met a person that didn't like words of affirmation and encouragement. We all do, don't we? And so that's an important thing. If, however, you have that as your love language, it's the air you breathe. One of my grandsons has this gift. And it's, it's interesting to me because if he's showing me something, he'll say things like, do you like it? Is it good? Do you think that's a good thing? You know, have I done a good job? Why is it? Because he's wanting that affirmation. So we need to be alert to people that need affirmation and encouragement, particularly in times in their lives when they're struggling. All right, the third thing, words of invitation. We can invite people to meaningful activities, and that's exactly what we've been talking about with the, with the girls' night out, moms together, Bible study, to, a walk, to go on a walk, to, to work out together. All of these things, when we give people an invitation or extend personal hospitality to them, have them into our home for coffee or go out together for coffee, all of these things express the, the type of of invitation that shows quality time. And this is, I think, the, the love language here. We are willing to spend quality time, maybe one-on-one -on -one or maybe in a small group, but we're willing to spend quality time with people. And so we invite them. Now, just for the fun of it, and I can't see you real well, but how many of you are here today because somebody invited, invited you? Not necessarily this year, but, but in recent years. How many of you are here because somebody invited you? Okay, a lot of hands, a lot of hands. Thank you. And this is the importance of inviting people to be part of what you're doing. This shows that you care about them, and this shows the, the willingness on your part to spend quality time with them. All right, the next one is one that we might not think of so much. I think the first three are pretty obvious. The fourth one is prayers. I think one of the greatest things we can do to reach out to people with words is to pray for them and then to let them know that you are praying for them because we really become connected through prayer. A number of years ago now, we were having a, a newcomer's uh, dessert. In those days, we had them in homes. Now we have them in church. 
which is a, a good thing because you take advantage of the childcare and all the other things that go along with it. But we used to do it in homes. And one time we were in a home and there were a number of women that were, were new and they came to this event to learn more about the church, more about women's ministries in particular. And one of the women, as we were going around and she was introducing herself, we asked everybody to introduce themselves. Some of the, the staff were there as well, the women's ministry staff as well as new women. And as we were going around, one of the women who was one of the newcomers <clears throat> began to introduce herself. And she kind of stopped and she said, I wasn't planning to do this, but she said, I just found out yesterday that I had breast cancer. Well, you can imagine the impact that this had on the room, sort of like now, just got very, very quiet. And she shared just a little, a few little details. And after she finished, finished excuse me, <clears throat> she was sitting next to me and I kind of put my hand on, on her shoulder, on the back of her shoulder. And I said, could we stop right now and pray for you? And she said, oh, I would love that. And so we did. And I, I don't remember, I think a few of the women prayed. And we just really lifted her up in prayer. Now, she lived many years after that. She is not now with the Lord. But she lived for many years after that. And various different times through those years, when I would be visiting with her for whatever reason, she would say to me, you know, you'll never know what it did for me when you stopped that meeting and prayed. She said, it just made such a difference. And so as a result of that, in the years that went afterwards, she would come to me and she would tell me specific things that she wanted me to pray for. I gave her that, that opportunity. And so she would come to me and say, I'm going to Anderson or I'm going this or I'm doing that or whatever. And would you pray for me? And I said, sure, I would be very happy to pray for you. So I think one of the ways that we reach out with our words is with our prayers. And we may not think about this so much, but this is an important way to reach out. We feel connected when we pray for someone. And then tell the person that you're praying for them. We need to be cautious that we don't share things that they don't intend to be shared broadly. And then we, so we do need to be sensitive in some of those areas. But because she had said it in front of the whole group, I felt free to then follow up on that and ask before the whole group if we could pray for her. Now, when I taught several weeks ago now, I gave you uh, some application questions, and I told you that I would put those on the outline, and so you do have them today. And I want you, again, to realize what these are for. These are strictly for your own reflection and meditation. These are not things that are going to be discussed in your groups. These are not things to make you feel guilty that you have to have a list of 25 things that you take away from this and that you're working on. That's not the idea at all. The idea is just to help us think through what this means. And so I've asked you, how well do you reach out in caring ways with your words? And various ways that we can do that. How do you invite others to join you in meaningful events and activities? And how do you do that? And then do you pray faithfully for friends with special needs and then let them know that you are praying? And again, we need to be careful regarding privacy issues and confidentiality issues. If you're praying for someone, you know something about their needs, don't necessarily ask them in a public setting how things are going because they may not want that information shared. If you know that it's public information, that's different. If you're not sure, Ask them through a text or something that would be private. How are things going? How can I be praying for you? So these are some of the ways that we can reach out with our words. A second way that we reach out is with our actions. The first one is practical support or service. And this, again, is one of the love languages, acts of service. This is mine. I'm very familiar with this one. And although it is a love language for some, like me, everybody, I think, from time to time, appreciates that kind of practical support or service. And one of the things that I do want to say right up front is sometimes the most practical thing that we can do is just physically be present. They don't really need their dishes washed or their laundry folded like I tend to do. They just need somebody to be there and to let them know how much they care and how much they want to support them. So practical support or service. Second one is kindnesses. And this is the love language of gifts, gifts of remembrance. 
I have a person who's been a good friend of mine for years and years and years. She knows that I don't bake. Very seldom do I bake. And I excuse it by saying that my husband and I really shouldn't have baked goods, number one, and it makes way too much for the two of us, and so I just don't do it. But this dear, sweet lady likes to bake and bakes a lot. And every once in a while, she doesn't do it all the time, but every once in a while, she'll bring a little plate of cookies, just a few little cookies that we can have for lunch or dinner or whatever. And this is how she expresses her love. Little acts of kindness, small gifts or remembrances. And some of you have those gifts too. You just love to gift people. And it is a great gift. This is one of the ways that we reach out with our actions. We also reach out in areas of physical touch. And again, this is a love language. Physical tusk, test, excuse me, touch is one of the love languages. And here we have, again, to be a little bit cautious. Although most people are very happy to be hugged or greeted in a warm way, some people do not for whatever reason. It may be something in their background or whatever, but they kind of stiffen. And if you sense that, I would encourage you to be very cautious. Maybe put your hand on their arm or shoulder or something another time because you want them to feel that this is an act of love. And if you're doing something that makes them uncomfortable, then to them it really doesn't come across as reaching out in love. We had a man in the church years and years and years ago now. They live somewhere totally away, away from here. But he was known as a hugger. And if you were in his line of vision, you knew that you were going to get hugged. That was just, and you can tell if a person has the love language of physical touch because when they come in a room, they hug everybody. Whether they know them or not, they hug everybody. And some people like that, some people really don't like that. So if that's, your, if that's your bent, I just warn you to be a little bit cautious. Most people like to have a pat on the shoulder or a hand on the arm or something like that. That's, that's not quite so restrictive. But be a little bit careful. But if that is something that is natural to you to express your love and your encouragement to people by touching them physically, that is certainly a way to do it. Okay, again. We need to apply this. How well do you reach out in actions of support or helpful service? How can you display kindnesses by extending a helping hand, even, even in a small, little, insignificant way? Those things just mean so much. And then how well do you literally give others a pat on the back? And that is important. There are times when we need to just pat them on the back and let them know how much we appreciate them. A hug of greeting or whatever. These are some of the ways that we can reach out to people with our actions. Very important to do. Well, in the book of John, in chapters 13 through 17, we have the record of Jesus' last words with his disciples before his betrayal and arrest. In fact, the first two verses of John 13, it says, it was before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. So this is the scenario here. This is, this is the context and the background. They're in Jerusalem. They've, they've left where they live in Galilee, and they've made the trip. They've walked down to Jerusalem for the Passover. There are three feasts per year that all devoted Jews attended in Jerusalem, and the Passover was one of them. So they were down there for this feast. And Jesus knew that he was at the end. And he knew the symbolism of all that was going to happen in the next couple of days. And so he wants them to know some things. As he's closing out his time with them, he wants to give them some final instructions. In John 15, 15, and we talked about this the last time I taught, Jesus actually called the disciples his friends. And he said that they were friends. They weren't just servants. They were friends. And he had, in fact, told them everything that the Father had given him. All that he knew from the Father, he had now told his disciples. And then he gives them some very key instructions on how he wants them to reach out. He has reached out to them. He's leaving, and so he wants them now to be his messengers to reach out to others. How he has treated them as friends is an example of how he wants them to treat others. And this, I think, is more important than anything we've said so far. We've talked about some practical things, most of them kind of no-brainers you knew anyway. 
But this is where the rubber really meets the road. This is how we treat a friend, how Jesus treated his disciples. And the first thing he did, according to John 15, is he loved, he told, told them to love as he loved. John 15, 12 and 13. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So he said, the most important thing is to love as I have loved you. Not just warm, touchy-feely emotions, but actually sacrificing yourself for your friend, putting their needs before your own. And that's what our study guide is talking about, how we need to become the friend that Jesus was, the friend that we want to have. We have to become that. And that, of course, is how Jesus loved. So he said that we are to love as he loved. The second thing that he tells us, he wants us to forgive. And this is in, sorry, that's just taking a long time to come up. This is in Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So the second thing, the second way that he wants us to love as he loved was to forgive. Now, because we are imperfect human beings, we obviously are going to have struggles and misunderstandings in our relationships. We all know that. And so we need to learn how to reach out in forgiveness as Christ forgave us. There's a, an old poet, English poet, Alexander Pope, who said, to err is human, to forgive divine. And that's very true. When we reach out to mend a fractured relationship in our lives. That's a God quality. God is the one who gives us the ability to be forgiving, to forgive. To forgive is divine. And so when we are forgiving in a relationship with another person, when someone has wronged us, we are acting more like God than probably at any other time in our lives. To forgive is divine. It is a God quality. And Jesus said, forgive. Forgive as I forgave you. The third one has to do with commitment, commitment to the Father's plan. Jesus was absolutely committed to do what the Father wanted him to do. And he did that as an example for us, that we would do exactly what the Father wants us to do. There are eight different references in the Gospel of John that talk about how Jesus did exactly what the Father wanted him to do. We're going to look at just four of them because I think they're really interesting. In John 6... Jesus is saying, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Why did Jesus come? To do what God wanted him to do. All right, the second one, John 8, 28 and 29. I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Why did Jesus come? to please the Father, to do what the Father sent him to do. All right, the third one we're going to look at from John 12. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Did he come with his own agenda to say what he wanted to say, to teach what he wanted to teach? No, he said, I came to say what the Father wanted me to say. Even my very words were exactly what the Father wanted me to say. And the last one, and this is, is John 17. <clears throat> Jesus is praying to the Father just before his death. And he says, I, he's referring to himself, have brought you glory, talking to God, on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Why did Jesus come? To do what the Father sent him to do. And he said, I've accomplished it. I've finished it. Now, these are four of eight. There are four more that say basically the same thing. Jesus did exactly what the Father wanted him to do. And this is his example for us. That's what we're here for, to do not what we want to do, but to do exactly what the Father wants us to do. Okay, what does the Father want us to do? Did you ever think about that? What does God want me to do? Why am I here? Jesus knew why he was here, and he did exactly what the Father wanted him to do. How do I know what the Father wants me to do? All right, John 15, 16. The Lord impressed this verse on me 
a couple of years ago, in the summer, two years ago. And I have prayed it virtually every day since then because it has made such an impact. Jesus is talking and he says to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give me. Now, we probably think to some degree that we chose to be a, a Christ follower. We made a decision to follow him. Don't we so, sort of feel that way? But Jesus said, no, not really. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I had a purpose for you. And that purpose was to bear fruit, was to reach out, was to show the world what I'm like. That's why God chose us through Jesus. And then he says, and whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Now, sometimes the Lord asks us to do things like, you know, me up here right now, that I think, why in the world he asked me to do that? I, I'm not good at that. I shouldn't be doing that. But what can I do? I can ask the Father in Jesus' name, and he will give me whatever I need to do what he wants me to do. That's the beauty of it. When it's his choice, when he has appointed us to do something, to reach out in whatever way, when he has appointed us to do that, he will give us what we need to be able to do it. Isn't that exciting? God's plan for Jesus' followers is to do what the Father wants us to do to do. Okay, let's think about how we apply that. How is love seen in the love that, the kind of love, the, the love that isn't just touchy-feely, but the love that really gives from the heart. How is that kind of love seen in Jesus also seen in me? And then how is forgiveness an act of love and reaching out to men a fractured rela relationship, excuse me, and what perhaps is an action that he's wanting you to follow up with that. And then how is Jesus bearing fruit through your life in ways that he has shown you to reach out? One of the most important acts of friendship that we need to grow and develop in is reaching out. That's the extending the hand, the fourth one that we looked at. Because this is going to bear the fruit that Jesus and God intend for our lives. Reaching out to care, to support, to minister, bears great fruit. And it pays rich dividends because we change our focus from the friend I want to have to the friend I want to be. And that's the bottom line. If I want to have more friends, I don't need to focus on having more friends. I need to focus on being a friend. Being the friend that Jesus was, the kind of friend that Jesus was. When I am willing to become and be the friend that he wants us to be, then I will bear fruit and he will give me whatever I need to bear that fruit for him. Father, we do thank you for these things that we've looked at this morning. We realize that we are here because you have called us and you have chosen us to bear fruit. You want us, like Jesus, you had a perfect plan for Jesus to do the things that only he could do. And in many ways, you have plans for us that only you can do through us. So thank you for that. Thank you for the opportunity to meet with other women that truly do want to be those that can reach out in your name. And I pray that as we think about the relationships that you have put in our lives, we are grateful for that and help us to use those relationships in ways that honor you, to reach out, to deepen the friendships that you brought into our lives and to be aware of, of people that maybe are looking for and needing relationship and friendship. As we saw in the early lessons, this was your plan and purpose. This is how you made us to be relational. We need relationships. And so help us to be alert and aware of women in our sphere of, of influence and involvement that really need someone to reach out to them. Help us to be that person, to bear that kind of fruit that reaches out in Jesus' name. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.